My guest today is multi-instrumentalist John McEwen, who has been recognized as the founding member and award-winning outstanding performer of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Now, John has made over 46 albums and seven solo records that have earned four platinum and five gold records, multiple Grammy Awards and nominations, CMA and ACM Awards, and even an Emmy Film Score nomination, and performed on another 25 albums as guest artist. John's production of Steve Martin's album, The Crow, won the 2010 Best Bluegrass Album Grammy. And John McEwen credits work that he has done on film scores as a major influence on his brand new album, The Newsman. And the album is an unprecedented move for John as the album is 11 spoken word tracks, all mini movies with his unique style of music behind each one. And he especially credits Tommy Lee Jones, who along with Sissy Spacek starred in Good Old Boys, for which he did the soundtrack. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome multi-instrumentalist and Grammy-winning artist and composer John McEwen to the show. Welcome, John. Thank you. It feels good to be welcomed by you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are very welcome, and I must say... In the midst of your 50 years with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, how did you get into scoring movies? I, I like to do things. And the band was fairly slow as far as its production level. It, you know, it would be, be like several years between records. And I had things I wanted to record. And some of it was music. And and I had these little film scores come up, like the... the uh, National Geographic, uh, Braving Alaska. That was the Emmy nomination. And Tommy Lee Jones called me one day. He was directing and acting in a movie with Sissy Spacek. That was another one. That was, I, I wasn't, I was aggressively pursuing the scoring, but it's a slow business, <laughs> you know? It's, and it worked out to where working with Tommy Lee, one of the music cues, he said, that's a real good cue. I'm listening to the cue. I'm not watching the screen. You got to pay attention to the fact that when the music detracts from the picture, it's not doing its job. You're supposed to support the picture. You're supposed to, if it's a sad thing, you have music that, you know, it, it, and unless it's a couple people driving in a car and they're just sitting there and the radio song is blasting away and, that's different, but in underscore, that was the important thing. And when I started doing this music for words, which is a newsman album, it was an important thing to remember. Don't well, you, get well, you you bring a lost art uh, back to life. I mean, a spoken word album played to music. Uh, what inspired to do such an album? Well, I've always done spoken word because <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to shake the world being a singer, you know, and there's just a lot of great singers out there. And I sing some songs, but I'm just basically barking out the melody to get the story across. And that's one version. <laughs> Doing the talking, though, has been something that I've been comfortable with for years starting with the Mountain Whippoorwill, which is a poem I did with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, oh, for 30 years in the middle of our show, I would do that. And, uh, and I would learn other things along the way and just file them away. You know, um, Fly Trouble, the Hank Williams song that's on this album, he recorded that in 1948. Well, I think it should be heard again because everybody's bothered by flies. <laughs> I was bothered by him. I couldn't figure out how to deal with it. And, you know, you ever sit straight up in bed with something circling around your head? You swat it in as it whizzes by, and it's just one pesky little fly. And he uh, he said it really good on that. So I, I did it again because when Hank Williams was Luke the Drifter, he did a lot of talking blues, you know, back in the late 40s. And... Uh, then other things came along. A friend of mine wrote, I'll be glad when they run out of gas. And Hans Olsen in Phoenix, that's Hans, H-A-N-S, 
it, it rhymes with chance, he says. Yeah, anyway, and then things just kept adding up. I had, oh, I've got four now. Oh, I've got five. A year would go by, I'd get another song and another piece and like that. Well, how did the audience re, uh, respond uh, when you tested some of the spoken word during concerts? I haven't done much of it yet, but I'm, I'm going to be doing more. But they always respond well. It's, it's, I mean, so well. It's like a hit record or something. It goes over as good as Mr. Bojangles and Will the Circle Be Unbroken, uh, the couple that I've done. And it's an exciting time for me. I feel like. At this age, <laughs> I'm putting out a record that seems to mean something to people. And, well, it's a uh, fantastic album, John. And, you know, you brought up Fly Trouble, which out of all of the tracks that I listened to on the new album, Fly Trouble is a little bit more of a song, but with spoken mixed in. And like you brought up the term, a talking blues. Um, that was pretty big back in the 1940s. Well, you know, it's been around a long time, and it comes and goes. Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie. Uh, King Tut by Steve Martin. You know, that was a number, a top ten, number two hit on Billboard. And that's the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. We played the track for that, and that was fun. And uh, and Devil Went Down to Georgia. The big, uh, that was a talking song. And, yeah, and it's part of Charlie Daniels. A lot of Jerry Reed music and things about the swamp and just, uh, but there hasn't been one in like 15 years. And there's been a lot of talking going on with rap music and hip hop and uh, poetry has exploded. There's 300 poetry blogs out there and those didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. And well, people you know, see- Yeah, yes. because- um- and you're right. It's probably been a good 15 years since we've heard uh, any type of talking blues in, in that genre, so to speak. And a lot of those ones that you mentioned, they crossed over. King Tut crossed over. Uh, yeah. Devil Went Down in Georgia crossed over into the pop chart or the rock chart. Uh, people still love that song to this day. But I went back and as I was listening to every track of your album, The Newsman, I have to completely agree that the with the assessment that these tracks are real mini movies. I mean, The Cremation of Sam McGee, published uh-huh. in 1907. Yeah. And as you recite it to music, it sounds like I'm listening to an old radio program or visualizing it as a movie. It's beautifully done. You're my guy. Boy, I love your... <laughs> Thank you. I, I worked really hard on that one. I had to find some new sounds for it. And and I did. Well, to take a... Like, you know what harmonics are on an instrument when you do this? Where you go... You know? You know what I mean? You're, you're, well, you're not really fretting the instrument. You're... Like that. Well, there's there's one on on Freemason and Sam McGee. Well, if you take away the pick, you know the picking of the string, and just on, on Pro Tools you can go in and chop off the picking sound and just keep the like if you can just imagine what that's like. Well, you can hear it on this. And it creates a sound that is... Well, it um, adds to the story and it brings emotion to the story. And I hope it makes a bunch of synthesizer players go, what kind of program is that? (laughs) It's a banjo. (laughs) Yeah, they got to look that up on Pro Tools, right? (laughs) Yeah, they won't find it uh, listed anywhere. Hmm. Well, for you, what is the difference in writing a song versus writing music to the spoken word, because even on the track, the mountain whippoorwill has a lot of spoken word with pauses in the music, for example. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that just comes out when I play it. It's just, I don't know, but it's hard to describe. 
it's something that just happens magically with that piece. Uh, playing the banjo. That started out with the, back in the 60s. Steve Martin had learned that. We were in high school together and worked in the magic shop in Disneyland. And then music came along. And then he learned the Mountain Whippoorwill out of the uh, English book, Adventures in American Literature. And I was playing the banjo. I said, Steve, let me put the banjo behind you talking. And we did that. And that was the first time we we were doing a little concert. I mean, this was like in the early, early days. This was before the Nitty Gritty Dirt fan, you know, 1965. We were doing a concert at a college and we did the Mountain Whippoorwill. And at the end, the room was silent. I thought, Oh God, this bombed. Oh no. But three seconds later, everybody stood up and was applauding. It was the first standing ovation I was ever part of. <laughs> and I went, I think it was good. <laughs> I think it worked, you know. And then Steve had to drop it because you can't be a comedian and in the middle of your show do the mountain whippoorwill. Up in the mountains, it's lonesome all the time. People would start laughing right there. Up in the mountains, it's lonesome for a child. <laughs> I wonder where he's going to take this, you know. So he dropped it, and I started doing it because I was already playing the banjo. And uh, what was your question? <laughs> well, I was asking, you know, what is the difference in actually writing a song versus writing music to the spoken word? You write to the to the words when sometimes you the emotion of the words, and it can take you places where you're not locked into doing just bar by bar. You got to put this lick here because uh, somebody is. It's different. It's it's scoring. It's like what I call a. It's like little films that haven't been made. You know, kill the, the Ford could be a music video. Well, is it if more? Well, yeah, because, you know, for you, and again, ladies and gentlemen, The Newsman debuts April 12th, and this is an album you have to have. Oh, um, man. And, you probably say that to everyone. No, what, hey, well, I, I only interview uh, uh, artists with great albums. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> but I have to tell you, John, I love this because... When you're if you're when you're writing music to the spoken word for you personally, is it uh, is it a peaceful process because there's so much artistry in this album, and uh, you know yeah. I could see a Grammy nomination for this type of album. Okay, we're done. Thank you. I'm gonna okay. <laughs> word word said it's gonna be nominated for a Grammy. Okay, great. We got that. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. I hope it just gets nominated. People think you win when you get a nomination. So it doesn't matter if you win or not. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. But again, this this is an album, John, that as I and I listen to these tracks more than once because it what it was not only entertaining to listen to as a storyteller, you're brilliant. And oh. it's something that I actually want. I actually want to hear more of it. And, and like I told you before the interview, it made me want to go on a road trip just so I could drive on a very long highway and just listen to these tracks one right after the other, because I'm focused on listening to the story and, and the music just adds that, that much more emotion to these incredible stories because a lot of these stories they're they're well over a hundred years old. Yeah. Uh Killed at the Ford was written in 1868 and Premier Sam McGee, McGee 1907. Uh as I mentioned uh, the Hank Williams one, Fly Trouble, 1948. Uh Nui Baden, that's a the one about the Vietnam War. Now that that is really a tough one. That was a tough one to read. Oh man, because you kept thinking. See, the guy that wrote that was at the Battle of Nui Baden, and he wrote this letter, this story, this poem to his brother, and he mailed it to him. 
And that was in 1968, 69. And his brother sent it to me 12 years ago. I read it and I went, man, that is powerful. That should be, I got to record that. And I, I, and I put it away and I came back to it two years later and I started going, hmm, okay. And then two years later after that, I found the music that I wanted to put with it. And then I started doing it and then I couldn't do it because it's so, it's so emotional. It's like we were just, we were just boys on the flight to the fight, expected to act like men. They put a gun in our hat, and we put a gun in our hands and said, "Don't worry, you don't have to win." You know, it was like I could picture that happening, and not knowing what you're going to do when you step off that helicopter in the middle of the jungle, and oh, it, it was anyway. I. No, you're right. And that brings up a question because you, you've you collected all of these um, spoken words, these poems or these stories. And and as you're writing the music uh, for each one, do you, do you feel like you're living that story as you're writing the music? As I'm, As I was narrating them, I felt like I was living that story. I finished Nui Baden and I was really depressed. <laughs> but I was happily depressed. One, I wasn't there. Two, he got out okay. He done he the guy that wrote it died twenty five years later from effects of Agent Orange, his brother told me. And um Anyway, it's just a really tough story. Well, how about, what was it like recording uh, Julie's theme? I'm sorry, what? What was it uh, like recording Julie's theme? Oh, Jules' theme. It, oh, yeah, Jules' that, theme. That was, uh, yeah, it, that was something. I wanted to put an instrumental on there. And I had this song that I wrote with a piano. And I can play it and people will go, oh, you play piano too. If I play the second song I know, they're going to say, what happened to the piano player? But I have a good one-trick pony on Jewel theme. And I recorded that because I think people should have a piece of music they can tell their personal story to or some something they want. And that was written around the idea of Jules Verne meeting a guy in a graveyard and he's talking to him about his young wife that had been recently deceased. And she died really young. And they had a great romance. And I tried to write a piece of music around that idea. Now, and, I love the title cut, The Newsman. Oh, great. And um, I understand, is is that a true story? Absolutely. It's a guy named Steve that was going around Hollywood in 1967. And I didn't see him until maybe a, a couple months into the career. You know, I was going to the airport in a cab. It's 530 in the morning going, yeah, this is really tough. I've got a tough life. This, this music thing. Yeah, I'm going to fly to Boston. I got a 15 hour work day. And I see this guy on the on his little motorcycle. And he's got newspapers all over it, you know, in the handlebars in front and in the back and the baskets. And he's, he's all crippled. Uh, that's what we called them then, crippled, right? They were, he was handicapped. And he's driving, and looks like he's going to fall off. But he keeps going up La Cienega Boulevard to Sunset. Where is that guy's going to work early, too? I saw him a week later when I was back in L.A., he came into the restaurant. Oh, here comes that guy with the newspapers. And he was, over the next many months, I saw him several times. And I asked people about him. Yeah, his name's Steve. I always give him a buck. I always give him an extra buck or two. Yeah, the poor guy. What a life. And he got in to see all the record company presidents that he wanted to. And 
heads of agencies. They were all right there in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard within a couple miles. And he, he was like, would you like to be a paper? And he was trying to communicate to people and he was doing it by selling newspapers. And I had to tell that story. And here it is 55 years later. And it's just really strange because, because he got something from everyone that no one had for each other, even, you know, all the, the burnt out hippies, or they aren't, they weren't burnt out hippies yet, they're going to burn out, getting into rock and roll, and the leftover alcohol people from the music business, 1967, you had a bunch of people from 50s and early 60s, they're all doing the same thing at Ben Frank's restaurant, eating breakfast, you know, getting ready for their day, and in comes the newspaper every day uh, on and any part of his route and uh, everybody respected him everybody i know they did they, they they said they did and they didn't respect each other they they didn't oh yeah that guy over there he's a real jerk he's an agent oh yeah you know well, that guy over there you know whatever but they all respected him, and I did too, and I, I just wish I would have told them. I wish I would have said, I wish I would have talked to them, but I was afraid of that. I was, a, I was a 21 years old when I met him, and I hadn't been around handicapped people. And I was afraid to talk to him because he was so familiar, you know, and but I wish I had found out more about him. But uh, I don't know. He, he probably made a fortune more than most of the people in the restaurant. <laughs> Why not? You actually give us something to think about even today that uh, we need to be more open to talk to people, uh, regardless if they're handicapped or, or not. We need to keep our face out of our phones and start communicating human to human because that's what makes this world go around. The thing I miss about traveling, people say, oh, you get tired of that. Tra I like traveling. It, it gets better and better. But you get on an airplane, and it used to be you'd get on a plane, and I mean, this is weird, because it was 50 years ago I'm talking about. I, I've been flying for 55 years. I've flown over 4 million miles. and. But you get on a plane and you sit down next to somebody and, hey, where are you from? Well, what you doing? Yeah. Huh? And you hear, go back and forth with all kinds of stories. And now you get on a plane and people go, they put on headphones or earbuds and they watch a movie or they listen to something. or they, It's just, there's very little conversation on, on most flights. And, uh, and so it's weird. Well, they need to start listening to the newsman. Pardon? They need no, to right. listen to the newsman. <laughs> if I can get that on the airplane uh, audio, that would, that, then I'd, I'd be able to go, hey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what has been the response to your new album from those who have heard it? It's, It's exciting because it, the reactions like yours. Oh, I'm glad this is out. This is taking a whole new direction. This is really uh, uh, a bunch of stories that I that I like to uh, listen to or figure out or whatever. I can play these over and over. I played it twice last night, you know, and it's it's just very positive. Very I'm ready. Positive. I'm ready for part two. Well, let's give me give them, let me get it out first. April twelfth, you know, is uh, is the big day for me. And I'm looking well, forward. I have to ask because uh, you produced Steve album Steve Martin's album The Crow, which won the Grammy in twenty ten. Uh, what was it like producing that album with Steve? Well, you know, Steve is not a guy that's like funny all the time. Yeah, he's just not. He's thinking. He's whatever. He's talking and. But he, he, when he's doing music, 
the song ends. Yeah, let's do it again. You rehearse the song five times in 15 minutes, you know, just over and over and over and over. So we're in the studio, and one of the songs I needed to have him count it off, Steve, I'm pushing the talk back button to talk to the studio, you know. Uh, Steve, you, you need to count this one off because you're hitting the first note. He goes, okay, everybody ready? One, two, three, four. No, Steve, Steve, stop. Wait a minute. You can't say the last number. We're in the studio, and it has to be silent just before your first note. Oh, okay, I get it. I get it. I'm sorry. Okay, everybody ready? One, two, four. <laughs> Everybody cracked up. <laughs> he was making a joke, and it was really funny. One, two, four, and he left the last number silent. And he started, <laughs> but it's that kind of thing. There's always a surprise. There's always some kind of surprise to be had. And Steve Martin is a nice guy. All he wanted to do, all he wants to do, is be a picker, a banjo picker, or all he wants to do is make people laugh, be funny. My mom used to say when he'd come over to the house after work at the magic shop, uh, around midnight or 11, we'd, he'd stop by and and learn a few banjo licks and, and he'd try to, hey, what do you think of this? These two guys, you know, we'd try a new joke or something. But we're like 17, 18 years old. And my mom would say, I don't know about that new friend of yours. It seems like he's always on. He's always performing. Yeah, well, mom, yeah, he is. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, but uh, he, he was. He didn't have much of a family life. And I think it was, a, it was taken out on stage. And it was wonderful. Well, definitely both of you have been uh, very successful. And what do you have planned for the rest of 2024 besides the new album, The Newsman? <laughs> Let me get it out first and then figure out. Uh, I've, I've got a book, a children's book of the Mountain Whippoorwill. It's illustrated. That's coming out soon. It's uh, 40 pages of wonderful illustrations. And uh, I've got an audio book of the book I wrote, The Life I Picked, which is about the life I picked. That's an audio book will come out this fall, I believe. And I'm going to try and make it, make it for them. Because people have said, are you doing an audio book? Are you doing an audio book? You know? And they're really popular, those audio books. So, yeah, I spent you know, several days doing it. And, That'll be fun. And I got an album idea that I don't want to talk about, okay? Because somebody else might grab it. Uh, anyway. And uh, I did Oh Susanna with a Sesame Street group. I mean, a bunch of kids. A bunch of kids, 20 goats and a cow. We did Oh Susanna, and I'm playing the banjo. Come from Alabama. And the kids are dancing around and everything. and. That's on, uh, you can find that on Google, on uh, John McEwen, O oh Susanna, Sesame Street, anything in that order. It's a cool video. And I'm putting out a, a songbook of O oh Susanna. It's got weird lyrics. Sun so hot I froze to death, you know. That'll be good illustrations. And you can go to this video and see it. And I, I, it might sell five copies, it might sell 5,000, but I want to do it. My, my granddaughter is doing the artwork. She's 30 years old. I mean, she's not the, young, she's not the oldest either. <laughs> but she's a real good artist. And uh, just a few things, yeah. Well, you go, you're going to have to come back when you get the, um, the other album or the, the, the audio book out. And uh, we can talk about that. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Grammy winner John McEwen will release his new album, The Newsman, on April 12th on Compass Records. It's an unprecedented move for McEwen as the album is 11 spoken word tracks, 
All yeah. mini movies with his unique style of music behind each one. From the opening title track, which is a true story that John just told us about, about a man who sold newspapers and was a tremendous influence on the young musician in Los Angeles to the final cut, Jules' theme inspired by Jules Verne telling a friend in a French cemetery about his recently deceased young wife. And John presents an album filled with stories that will inspire and perhaps bring a tear to your eyes. So head over to johnmcewen.com for all of his music and tour schedule. And remember, you've got to get the brand new album, The Newsman, debuts April 12th. And John, I want to thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. Like I said to my mom, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, you were very, very, very welcome. And you got to come back with the new audio book. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for watching and listening. And as for me, I'll see you next time.